so um gonna try it on my uh, laptop again um, I had quit for a while and I'm just using document camera so let's see so this is uh, class number 14 flexible mechanical elements um, I haven't taught this uh, lecture before so let's see how it goes and um, I guess I'll stick with the red okay so There you go. Flexible uh, mechanical elements. We're talking about belts and chains and wire rope and uh, flexible shafts are already on here, but I didn't draw one in any of those. Uh, but here's a here's the wire rope similar to what we were doing for our um, our hoist project. All right. Um, I just really like this picture right here. I mean, I, this brings me back. I love ships. I, I loved working on ships. And uh, you get this little cargo winch. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming it's for some some type of cargo winch. Actually, it could be part of a, a lifeboat davit. Um, but yeah, yeah, just out at sea. Um, uh, that would be great. Um, and timing belt is right up here on an engine. And we'll talk about timing belts just a little bit. We won't do any calculations with them. So, um, so I, I wanted to also, as part of this, talk about the advantages and disadvantages, and I didn't leave a slide uh, uh, for that. So let me um, end the show and put in an extra slide uh, somewhere in here, just to write down what the advantages and disadvantages are of um, flexible elements here. All right. So. Um, uh, the see if this thing will um, advantages. Okay. Some of the advantages, um, one of the biggest advantages is alignment. Okay. Um, so if you have gears, you have to make sure that they're very well uh, aligned, but you can have some amount of misalignment when it comes to having like a belt or even with a chain, you could have a certain amount of it being um, um, moved around. Um, it doesn't have to be nearly as precise and aligning um, equipment can be uh, very um, annoying and tedious very important uh, not having things misaligned can uh, really cause damage to equipment so having something that's uh, um, can, can allow for some of misalignment is very uh, practical and useful um, we can have vibration and shock isolation so if you have a very rough running load or a very rough lo running driver, uh, you can isolate them from the uh, from from each other, and uh, they won't have uh, the one vibration won't uh, transmit. Um, you don't have the same thing with through gears or with a coupling, right? Um, one of those is inexpensive, and uh, right next to inexpensive, it's got easy maintenance. All right, so you can just, uh, if these things go, you just replace them, right? Not not as big of a deal uh, with the gears, right? The, the, the gears are much more expensive, and if they chew up, they, there's a good chance it's going to mess, it could possibly mess up some other pieces of equipment in, in the uh, thing. Um, also, uh, I wrote down alignment, and maybe really close to there, we could say this flexible arrangement. Um, and especially center to center, right? You don't, if you want to have, uh, separate the two pieces of equipment apart um, further, uh, this really works pretty well. Um, and uh, so it, it, in like belts, there's almost no limit to how far, uh, especially flat belts. Uh, there can be some with V belts and chains. You don't want to go too far separating the two pieces apart. But um, it's, it's a very useful, uh, to this uh, having that flexible arrangement. And then um, another one, you could have multiple, multiple driven shafts. Now that's true, I guess, with, um, you can have with gears, right? With the gear train, you can uh, have different shafts, uh, onto the thing. But this is a nice, uh, uh, kind of quality to have, um, as you actually saw with the timing belt, right? You can see that we could have like fan belts and auxiliaries and all that kind of thing in, in your car. Uh, just one belt that's wrapping around a, a bunch of different places and driving things. Um, some of the disadvantages though.
and they're important to think about. Um, belts slip, all right? So um, there's a certain amount of, uh, and they slip and they creep, by which I mean that over time they get longer, right? So they get looser. Um, they, you can think that they stretch. Um, and in doing so, they have like inexact um, ratios. Right, so you're not necessarily going to get that that perfect. Um, you're not going to get exactly that perfect uh, uh, conjugate action, if you will. Right, uh, and it, you've probably heard some people that their fan belts were slipping. Right, you can hear them screeching uh, as as their you know their engine starting up. That's usually a fan belt uh, that you hear from a, from a car uh, that's loose and is uh, squeaking really loud. Um, so that's belts, um, chains. Um, Chains uh, can get uh, have a have slightly um, off uh, uh, contact ratios, slightly off uh, precise uh, ratios, and um, some uh, jerkiness. Uh, uh, I guess we'll say jerkiness. Um, that's because. Um, the, the chain stretches too, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about those in change. You'll see that they're, uh, you can almost think of like a little polygon uh, that's turning, right? Um, because it's not a perfect, uh, perfectly round piece, right? There's, it's segmented. So um, if you, when, if you had like a, uh, like a, I don't know, let's, let's make it just a six sided piece, right? But this be very, very segmented right here. As this was turning right here, right? And if you had a, a belt that was tangential to this, it would be not. It'd be faster on the points and slower on the flats, right? So that's not going to make a perfectly uh, conjugate action uh, when it comes to its partner in crime over there. Okay, so um, we we found out some things that we want we, we like about belts and chains. Um, and, and we can also put wire ropes in there, but all the wire ropes usually, well, they can transfer loads, they usually just like vertically and that kind of thing right there. Um, but they, they all of these have, have, uh, similar uh, traits, some uh, better than others. So you can see that, uh, in this belt section, we have flat belts right here, right? And these uh, rely entirely on friction, um, between, uh, the surfaces, uh, right here. Um, and then we also have, we could have ribbed belts, which are very, very similar, but they have more surface area. And also, um, we'll, as we'll see with the V belt over here, these, uh, these notches can have a slightly different angle, uh, than the, um, than the little, the little pieces right there. So in, in the grooves. So that'll help to really, to, to grab a hold and uh, to increase the friction. Now this one does not rely, when you have a tooth timing belt, this gets closer and closer to a chain right here, but um, it, the reason why this is used as a timing belt is that this is more precise. There's not slippage uh, going on right there. And when we talk about a timing belt, we're usually referring to an engine uh, so that they're timing the valves, right? So you wanna make a connection. So when the crankshaft turns, a certain number of turn, uh, like one turn, right? Uh, or, or I guess it makes two turns. The the camshaft uh, that is attached, that, that is uh, uh, manipulating the uh, the valves, that it will turn every other turn, right? So that'll make sure that the uh, you're you're timing the valve opening with the position of the piston as it's coming up and down. And so that's why it's called a timing belt, as you control the timing of that. And then we. Have have the V right there that's also uh, relies on friction right there but we're kind of like it's grasping right here because because the uh, the angle with um, in inside the sheave is going to be uh, uh, narrower than the angle of the belt so it's it, when you apply tension onto the thing it's really uh, doing a lot more grabbing uh, going on but you're seeing some of the uh, dimensions that were placed on here an important uh, thing to look at is when we start or when we start to uh, try to analyze uh, belts is the geometry uh, that's taking place between uh, the two sheaves. Usually one's going to be bigger than the other. Uh, quite often the smaller one will be driving uh, the larger 
um, but that doesn't have to be the case. Um, in uh, from another book, and, and and everything you see in green is from the book called Collins, uh, the where the uh, author, or perhaps the editor, his name is Collins. Um, so this came from them, and um, it's it's kind of interesting that the tension isn't the same everywhere, right? That's that's the point of this uh, thing right here. And we have different kinds of tension. So they they start off with this point A. Uh, right here, which is I lost it. Where did A go? Right. Okay. There's right there in the middle of the belt right there on the slack side right there. Right. So you're seeing um, this the this thing is moving this way. So it's going to have the highest amount of tension um, over on the drive on the tight side. Right. Um, but it actually kind of uh, diminishes a little bit, right? So uh, some of the tension that you'll see is because of centrifugal um, uh, forces. Uh, and uh, they do a derivation uh, to put through those. We also have um, some pre-tensioning uh, that uh, takes place that's going to cause uh, the tension on the slack side. We also have, now we have the belt um, right here. So it, as it's coming down to uh, point B right here, you'll see uh, that it starts, the belt actually starts to stretch and slip just a little bit. There's a little bit of slipping and a little bit of stretching uh, going on all the way along here right and then as soon as it hits here it kind of lets go a little bit so it actually drops down uh just a bit uh in tension and then so we have the tension uh that's going all the way along from c d and e until it gets to e and now it actually over here it actually uh, uh builds up and there's a certain uh jerk if you will um, and uh, once again, it is, it's, it's stretching um, and slipping just a little bit. And I don't mean like completely slipping. It's just slipping relative to where it should be on, on the drum, right? So there's, there's kind of a uh, uh, relative motion uh, type of thing because the, the belt is, stri is slipping, right? And it should be like a point should be like matched over here but it's actually because it's stretched over there. So there has to be some slipping action in there. So that's one of the reasons why there's a curve um, coming in into this thing. It's not uh, evenly distributed, the amount of slipping and the amount of stretching. Uh, it relies on this friction to cause uh, the, these motions right here. And then as soon as it lets go over here, it drops off and we're back over to the uh, slack side. Uh, tension. So it's an interesting uh, type of um, uh, evolution uh, that you'll see. And um, some interesting things that can be done with flat belts that can't necessarily be done with a V-belt. Uh, we have this crossover arrangement. That's kind of interesting that could do. Uh, you can do this with V-belts, so I don't know why we said we didn't. Uh, I said that here. Uh, I don't think it's a very good idea to have this a type of crossing thing taking place where you have shafts uh, if you were to use a v-belt you definitely can't do this where you could actually use this like shifting fork to like move uh, this driven pulley over to a loose pulley thereby this is a, a type of clutch mechanism um, here's one uh, where they're showing I wonder if I can make myself smaller that's a always been a question we've all wanted to know can I make myself smaller yes I can look at that check it out I can even move myself down here move myself over there okay pay attention um, anyway th this right here we have some speed control it's kind of interesting you can shift uh, shift this belt over and you can change the ratios we also have another one where we can uh, we could do the same thing here. We might have to have a couple of uh, forks right here where we can shift back that way. Here. And you're noticing the belt's going to stay the same length, right? But the ratio of the uh, of the circles to each other, they're different. So you're going to change what your uh, speed ratio is going to be. Kind of a neat deal, um, I think. Now, if you're going to uh, try to do some analysis on um, this belt tension here, you're always going to start off with a free body diagram, right? So we have actually two free body diagrams here. And I'm not going to go through the derivation of this, but just so you know, one of the things you would use, you would use an FBD and an IBD in order, and Shigley doesn't, they 
half-ass it. Um, and any, anyway, uh, you do that, and you can find the centrifugal loads, uh, the, centri- uh, the, the, the load uh, or the tension in the belt because of centrifugal action. Um, and that they usually call that with the C, that FC. Um, I is the initial one. Uh, the the uh, uh, let's see. I'm going to say this right way, right? Yeah, the initial tension it says it right there, Domain. And they're calling this the hoop tension due to uh, centrifugal force right here. And then we have a, a tension due to the transmitted torque right there, right? So um, when you go and take a look at uh, the um, the torque. Right. Um, a, as a basic equation, we would say that delta F right there um, uh, divided by, uh, let's see if I'm going to write this right. Oh, my other screen just went dead. I'm going to bring him back. I don't want to go, him to go to sleep. Uh, you would say that was going to be equal to two times the torque divided by the diameter right there. They, li- they like to put that in there, right? Or, um, yeah, so... Um, let's see. And okay, so the main equation, like you could say that the the main equation, like uh, that the one that uh, kind of makes all of this work right here, is one that was done by way of also an FBD, right? It was also created right there, where they uh, worked through and they integrated, um, and they were able to find. Uh, this ratio right here. So I am going to first. I'm going to going to say the ratio between the two forces is going to be equal to E raised to the coefficient of friction uh, times the wrap angle right here. Right. So the wrap angle. Uh, you got to get that. You got to from geometry right here. You're going to see that there is like a, a phi right there that kind of decides. Uh, and see. Let's go back to the geometry one. Uh, so you can see that you can, um, yeah, through right, right through here, right. So you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to work through and find what those angles are gonna be. And then they're showing theta d, but they later call it uh, a phi, or right in there. But that's like the main equation, uh, right in here. But they also they go ahead when they write this in this instant. Um, this way right here and one of the reasons why I highlight this right here and I might actually do the derivative in uh, the class on um, belt uh, uh, brakes when we use belt brakes um, we use the same equation just doesn't have the FC in there but this is really about the distribution of the friction um, along this right here and, and uh, if you want to see the the how that works right here check out this curve right here right that right there is describing that right there is the one that's the, the function of the uh, um, the exponential right there raised to the coefficient of friction and they use this F is equivalent to mu right there so that it's a coefficient of friction and um, another thing we, we uh, might want to find because uh, we, we've seen FC everywhere um, simplified they take the mass of um, you know and, and this is actually mass per length and uh, they take the radius of the thing it ends up being squared because of the way uh, the units work out and we have an omega squared right there right so this is what we need to know if we want to have the um the the hoop due to centrifugal force so be careful with the units when we get uh to those um now there's way too many uh, equations in in this section um it's actually a little overwhelming so it's really better to uh, go through an example and i'm going to use the example in the book um, in the next uh, video, this one I'm going to uh, uh, stop uh, because I have a, it's going to be long enough right here at this point. Um, but here's like a step by step thing, and we will go through this in the example. Um, and in the eleventh edition, they actually annotate the example with these steps, but I don't think they do with the ninth or tenth. So I think that's an improvement. Uh, in it, but so we're going to go along with this thing, and um, I will talk about it in the uh, next uh, lecture. So that was our introduction to flexible elements and belts, etc. So let's end the show, discard all this, and take a look at how long we made a 20-minute video.